we'll get started here. Thank you everyone for showing up um, while Joy is getting set up. I'll go ahead and um, begin with introductions. Um, so I'm so excited to gather here as a community um, and amplify the voices of these inspiring women, our panelists, and amplify your voices through the Q&A that we have planned at the end. Um, so why today? Today is World Voice Day, which is not as well known as some of the other awareness days. Um, but it is, in fact, a movement and an organization. And um, it really started with the physiology, the biology, and the bioacoustics of the voice, but has evolved to um, be more about the value of vocal expression and um, giving an individual agency and power through the voice. And at Corral, that is all too relevant um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Corral, we're a faith-based nonprofit um, based in Cary and Raleigh. And we provide adolescent girls in higher situations with skills, resources, and opportunities so they can gain access to bright futures. And so we do this through a holistic long-term program of um, mental health services, educational support, vocational training, and college prep. And this year, the theme ha really has been um, adapting to COVID and this environment um, and providing full-time programming for our participants. And um, for, I think for girls who have been through trauma, voice seems to be one of the first things that's taken away, um, you know, as a form of self-protection and shutting down. So um, it's really relevant and we've been advocating our girls to really advocate for themselves um, for through their educational needs, whether it's special education needs or mental health services or even setting boundaries and relationships. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists that we have here today. So um, I'm not sure what order you can see everyone in, but um, I'll start with Sonora Caldwell. She is a lead horse assistant and has been exemplary in in leadership um, for our equine volunteer team at our carry location. And then we have um, Victoria Smith, who's the founder and president of the Wake County Black Student Coalition and the leadership intern at Southeast Raleigh Promise. Um, and then Tracy Dokes, who is the CEO and president of MCNC. And also we're really lucky to have her on our board. Um, same with Jennifer Castillo, she's also on our board. And she is the Director of Youth and Family Engagement at Southeast Raleigh Promise. And then DJ Sonotas, who's a Corral participant. And also, I'm gonna throw this in there, an amazing artist, poet, and author. Yep. <laughs> and then uh, Joy Curry, who is our Executive Director and Co-Founder um, of Corral. Corral has been around since 2008. So, um, we, so to give you an idea of the flow, uh, we have three questions um, for the first chunk of time, and then towards the end, we'll move into a Q&A. Um, for, for, at 1240, we'll switch over into a Q&A where y'all are invited to ask questions in um, the chat feature. Um, so without further ado, we will dive into the first question. Um, so we can start with Victoria, but feel free to chime in. So what is your big why? Um, what drives your purpose behind the work you do? And in general, what motivates you? So for me personally, um, I've just spent a lot of my time, you know, working with like students as like with the Black Student Coalition and a lot of times um, through activism, I started kind of activism when I was in eighth grade, starting with um, like environmental justice and that sort of thing. And then eventually moved on to more focusing on like racial injustice and inequality and like what we can do as students to like activate that and like um, kind of break down this the systemic oppression um, of like POC. Um, and so throughout the, that work, you know, a lot of times I, and Ms. Jennifer knows really well, a lot of times I'm always kind of the young one at the table, or I'm always, you know, the kid or kind of seeing that angle. 
And so a lot of times when you are the younger one, a lot of times like your voice can be put down or seen and looked over. And I had, I feel like many times I had just as much right to be there as any other person. Um, but all the time my, my voice would kind of be like shut down or turned off or whatever. Um, and I wasn't kind of given that platform. So I thought, you know, this past summer, one of my really good friends, Jacob Lemma, um, him and I decided to form the Wake County Black Student Coalition to give a voice to students who want to fight for racial injustice and inequality. And um, all of our like team members are all high school students. Um, some are in college, some are like younger, middle school or whatever, but we're all the foundation is around students and giving us a voice. Um, we're, it's all led by students. We obviously have mentors like Miss um, Jennifer or like um, some Miss uh, Letha Muhammad with the Education Justice Alliance and other people to kind of give us that support that we need. But um, I think the biggest moment or the biggest kind of why for me is just, I wanted to be able to speak up and know that my voice can be heard, no matter my age, race, gender, sexuality, whatever it may be, you know, I have a right to speak up and use my voice um, and be heard just as much as the next person. So that's kind of, I guess, my why. <laughs> Jennifer, do you want to go next? Thank you, Victoria. Sure. Um, and, and I'm just grateful, you know, we, we see and hear the news all the time, but then you hear young people like Victoria share, and I'm like, okay, it's going to get better. Um, and so I just am grateful for the opportunities to serve and learn with and from our youth. Um, and my why, I think, comes back to my faith um, and Micah 6 eight. Um, so those are, you know, the act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That that kind of, if whatever I'm doing aligns with that, I feel good, and it resonates with my my core values. So I think that's my why. And then like Victoria shared those personal experiences. Um, I was a first generation college student, and I didn't know how to navigate those systems. But my Hispanic Latino advisor, um, he really did it with me so I could learn how to advocate and use my voice. And so I've always wanted to make sure to be that David Flaytas to everyone around me. Great, and whoever wants to go next, um, Trace. Hi, I can go next. Um, years ago, I had the benefit of um, being in a leadership class with the former president of Bennett. Her name was Janetta B. Cole. And she really emphasized to all of us women that were in this leadership program is there's your faith, there's your family, there's your work, and there's community service. There, you have to put energy into all those things, no matter what you have going on. And at the time, I didn't realize why that was so important. And then I've read this book called uh, What Happy People Know. It's my favorite book in the whole world. And it speaks about altruism and how you know, careless, you know, selflessly caring for others gives you immense joy. And I couldn't understand how that was happening, but it does. And using community service as a way to provide a voice is also very, very important. And so in the work that I do and the work that I've done um, over the years, it's really been about working with communities in order for them to have voices. Uh, I worked with uh, in the governor's cabinet before and now um, at MCNC where our responsibility is education and school connectivity. Uh, that to me is giving other people voices. And I think that is just as important. And in a world where right now it feels like you can't offer a whole lot, it helps to know that you can improve people's lives and like you're doing something. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing. Um, GJ, do you want to go next? <laughs> Um, I guess my why would be I have gone through a lot and voice is a very touchy subject. So uh, anybody who knows me knows I'm, I'm fairly loud <laughs> and I, I don't struggle to get my point across to anybody I'm talking to. But 
it wasn't always that way for me. I grew up with a speech impediment and was always looked down upon for that. And so I hated talking. I hated using my voice. Um, and so it's just, it's nice that I can be somewhere like Corral that that doesn't matter. I can use my voice by writing or drawing, which is something I'm fairly good at. So. Thank you, DJ. Uh, Joy, do you want to chime in? Yes, I have to chime in uh, and, and just echo what, what DJ is saying. Uh, she does have a very powerful voice and, and not just from a loudness standpoint. Um, her peers listen to her, adults listen to her, and she has really valuable things to say. Uh, so um, that is a gift that God has given her. We talk a lot about superpowers at Corral, and that's one of her superpowers for sure. In terms of my why, uh, it also comes from my faith. I feel that my work is very much a calling and it is something that God has prepared me for since the, the very beginning of my career. Um, God has given me uh, tremendous uh, resources, uh, both in my, my personal life, as well as my professional life, as well as my experiences. Uh, I grew up on, on the farm that Corral is, is on. Uh, I have a background in school leadership and I've had some incredible teaching experiences prior to coming to Corral. And so, uh, you know, I very much come from an idea that too much is given, much is expected. And God has called me to this work and, and my why day in, day out uh, just comes from an idea of, of faithfully responding to that calling, uh, even when it's hard. So uh, it's, it, this work is very much a calling and, and for me and, and that's why I do this. Thank you for sharing. Sonora? Um, so I would say that my why is my future. I'm a really hard working person. And I I think as a kid or like as a teenager, we always just want to be successful in the future and just live our dream life and stuff. And so I, I always try to think of things. I motivate myself by doing things that would I think would benefit my future self and prepare me for my future goals. And so I'm, I'm also someone who truly believes that if you want to achieve it, like any, um, you can do anything if you put the work in for it. And so that's my why, that's what motivates me. And yeah. I just wanted to add one thing um, to what DJ was saying. So for me personally, I also have a speech impediment. If you can't tell, I talk really fast and I stutter sometimes. Um, and so growing up, like I had to go to speech therapy and even now, like I still stutter and talk fast and all that stuff, but I can definitely relate to the whole thing of like, it can be hard sometimes when like, you know, you're trying to speak or talk up or say something and like you like physically cannot say it because like certain words I like can't get out. I'm like, wait, I'm going to stutter. Give me a second. <laughs> like I need a minute to kind of process it. But I think it took me a while to kind of grow up and realize that, you know, like I think I, one thing I, my, my mom would always tell me is like back kind of looking back in the Bible, like Moses had a speech impediment, but like God called him to go and like free the people of Egypt. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that in itself, like, God will use um, kind of our gifts and our talents um, and like set a place for us. And so I just wanted to kind of like mention that as well. Like I'm in the same boat as you girl, like I totally understand. And it, it, it can suck sometimes and it, it is hard, but I think that I never thought I'd be, you know, giving speeches and stuff and giving talks um, out and at protests or crowds, but like, you know, like I'm doing that. And so I just wanted to kind of like speak that word um, as well. Yeah, it's inspiring to see um, people when they turn their challenges into, they realize that they're actually gifts and it's so hard to see it in that moment, but then later you see the full circle. Um, so that's really amazing to witness. Um, I just wanna throw this out to any of you um, panelists. What do you think it looks like to be a leader? So I feel like we all exemplify leadership in our own ways. And so what are some ways you've learned uh, to be a leader? And what do you think it looks like to be a leader, like values or attributes? And anyone can chime in. I can go, I guess. Um, so I think to be a leader, you have to be confident in the decisions and the actions you choose to make. 
and I think it is it can be hard to gain confidence but like DJ and Victoria were saying and Victoria was chiming in on like um it um it might be that might be a challenge you have faced with the speech impediment but then you can turn those challenges into gifts or they are gifts and you can um push past your you're you might be intimidated to speak we can push past it and you can gain the confidence and truly because once you believe that you're confident anyone else will listen to you and um and that's what a great leader is and i think there's lots of different kinds of leaders right but i think to be effective you have to be self-aware which is something we don't all have the privilege like schools don't always do that right away and sometimes that doesn't happen in families with trauma so i think that's something huge Corral works on is, is that self-awareness. I think the other thing and the unique thing that I think oftentimes women bring to the table is the ability to listen. So like Victoria hearing and making that connection. I think good leaders don't always have to be out in front. They have to be with the people and listening and learning. I agree, Jennifer. Um, you know, much like altruism, when you're selflessly caring for others, for me, the same rules apply for the employees or the people that you feel like you lead. There is a um, an amount of caring and empathy that has to go into that. When I was younger in my uh, career journey, I always felt like I had to behave like a man would. So not to show emotion and you know not to um, speak too loudly, all of those things. But what I found out is it just made me tired and silenced. And, uh, and it was a struggle to continue doing that. And so as I got more confident, as Sonora is saying, my voice got louder, more importantly, it got stronger. And I think, you know, that is a really important point about leadership is finding your voice in whatever way that comes to you. And also, as a leader, helping other people grow in their leadership so that you've got your, and I'll, I say this all the time, Joy's probably tired of hearing it, but I always say finding your village or your tribe so that you can amplify each other's voices um, in a very supportive way, I think is incredibly important for um, women leaders in particularly, um, but I, I think you know, women in leadership have a different kind of accountability than other people do. I just wanted to add, like, being a, a woman and like in this, and then also being a woman of color, like, it can be hard at times. I'm not gonna lie. Like, there are times when, um, you know, I've kind of wondered, like, oh, well, because my my kind of co-founder, um, Jakob Lemma, he's a he's a black guy, um, and so for him, you know, a lot of times. I'll see the well different things will be given to him or like I'll think well maybe I should let him like lead this talk or maybe I should let him like lead this session or whatever it may be just because I'm like well you know maybe I don't I don't feel like I'm valid enough or whatever the case may be um but as I've kind of like grown in this leadership position and like realized certain things um one thing I can take away is that like I feel like a true leader not only like kind of what similar to what, what Michelle was saying, but like not only being in the front, but also kind of being in the back, but truly in like taking in what others are saying around me is so important. Um, a lot of times I feel like I, in my mind, I thought leaders would kind of, you know, I'm gonna be honest, like looking from um, when I was growing up, I always thought, you know, like for an example, would be like pastors and churches and stuff and ministers, and they're kind of always in the pulpit and like front and center and like giving these talks. But I realized like there are so many leaders behind the scenes that do so much work that adds just as much value as the person up there on the mic speaking. Um, there's so much that goes behind the scenes that people don't get enough credit for. So I try my best as, you know, being like a leader, I try to encourage those around me like, hey, I can't do this without you like by my side or without your help. And like, just as much as you guys say like, oh, we need you, like, I need you as well. Like, I need your help and support because I truly think that there is no one person who can do it on their own. And that's what I've realized is, especially this past summer, like planning different protests and that sort of thing, like 
things. Um, I tried taking on the weight of the world. I tried being like, I can do this and this and this and this and get no sleep at all and be fine, wake up at like 5 a.m. the next morning and keep it going. And like, I was so like worn out and drained. And um, one thing is also working as like a SERP intern where I'm currently working, I'm in this group that's working with UNC um, public health, like grad students who are in the public school, school public health, excuse me. Um, and they're working on this curriculum for um, mental health. And so I remember um, one time we were trying to schedule a meeting and I was like, oh yeah, like I have school, but like I can like figure out my schedule and work around it. And Jennifer was like, nope, like, like you need time for yourself. Like, it's okay. Like they'll, they'll be fine. Like focus on you and like making sure that it's a balance. And so I think being a leader, like there's so many different aspects and different things that come along with it. But I think the biggest thing for me is like, sometimes being okay with taking a step back and being like, I need time for me because I can give and give and give and give. But if I don't have time for myself then like, how am I going to restart the next day? And how, how am I going to keep this going? It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and just kind of depending on the others or others around you as well, not just like yourself. Um. I think one of the most important qualities a leader can have is being a follower at one point. Um, I think why I get along with a lot of the girls and can lead them in some aspects is because I can't lead them in others. I don't know everything about horses or academics or cooking or cleaning and I need help sometimes like Victoria was saying like I can't do everything by myself and I can't lead them in everything but I'm not going to lead them in nothing so I can accept being a follower in something that I can acknowledge I don't know very well. And after that, if somebody comes to me or I see somebody struggling in something that I do know, then I can lead them and I can offer my help. I just wanted to add like one of the biggest um, takeaways that I've had, whether it's been like, you know, learning from, from different teachers or different organizers or whatever it may be, like just um, kind of being in the presence of other leaders and stuff. But one of the biggest things that I've valued most is when after someone's done giving a speech or like working in SERP, we'll have a lot of um, guest speakers come and give a talk. And afterwards they'll come up and be like, hey, like, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh, like, I'm doing good. Like, how are you? And just being able or a pastor on a pulpit or whatever the case may be, you know, having someone to kind of come and like humble themselves and kind of meet you like where you're at and just like talk to you like you're human and just kind of being a friend. Like, I think that is one of the most valuable things ever. And kind of what DJ was saying, like kind of having that where you can like lead and, but you can also fall at the same time where you can kind of take off that hat of being this leader and also just kind of be like a friend to someone and just be down to earth with someone. I think that honestly speaks more volume to a leader and who you are than being up there with a microphone or doing whatever it is you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think being able to kind of come down and just be like, yeah, like I'm just, just like you, I make, make mistakes. I fall down sometimes, but I can get back up. Like that really speaks more rather than just kind of being front and center all the time of everything. This idea of followership is something uh, we talk a lot about at Corral, particularly because we work with horses. And uh, developing the skills of followership is so important in leadership. With horses, uh, there's not necessarily a, a social hierarchy where you know there's one um, horse that's always in charge. They have different roles and they, they develop uh, more horizontal relationships within their herd, even though each individual does have a role uh, and some roles may look more like a leader. Uh, and then those roles are, are interchangeable at times even. And I think that's one of uh, probably the skills I've, I've learned at Corral is, is how important uh, that, that not always being in sort of an alpha role is to leadership. Uh, we have a core value at Corral of uh, teamwork and, and community relationship at first is how we, we relationship first and community is how we describe it. And uh, the idea that when we're operating in a team or a community, we're going to be so much stronger. And so as a leader at Corral, I very, very rarely make decisions kind of 
unanimously. It's often done in a, with a teaming approach uh, with the board of directors or, or our leadership team or amongst the, the, the other teams that, that operate at Corral, be it volunteer teams or operational teams or programming teams. And so this idea of leadership of being you know, on, on an island and, and to yourself at the, the very top of a social hierarchy isn't always a, a, a great model of leadership. And particularly it's one that can be very difficult uh, for women. And so kind of connecting the dots of what Tracy was saying, having, having your group, having your tribe, having uh, a, a group of people that together form leadership, I think is a, a, a really important idea in leadership. Yes, thank you for adding that, Joyce, that balance between humility and confidence, knowing when to listen, knowing when to speak up. Um, so wanted to move on for time's sake to the next question. Um, how has this pandemic um, been for you? Uh, we've been in it for a year. And how have you overcome any obstacles, whether that's using your voice or stepping up in another way? And feel free to go answer in any order. I don't want to talk too much because I can talk a lot. <laughs> but um, I, oh my gosh, this uh, COVID quarantine, all of this has been absolutely crazy for me. Um, like I, before I was saying that like, yeah, I'm, I'm in my senior year, I'm about to graduate in a month and like 20 something days and I'm so excited, but it kind of sucked, um, if I'm being honest, to have, you know, half of a junior year and then like none of a senior year um, be in person um no prom you know none of these dances no homecoming football games like none of that um and and so it, it i'm not gonna lie like it really did hurt and it took a toll for me honestly because i am such like an extrovert i love people i love going out i love having fun i love just being even just being in a room with people and just, just talking like that that's where i'm most happiest at and so to have that kind of all ripped apart where we're now you know on a screen like that was really really hard for me and I think it honestly made me kind of take a step back. I feel like this was a wake up call for so many of us, but I really had to take a step back and kind of evaluate my life. And even though, you know, I started at the out being like 17 and now I'm 18, but like even at 17, I was going through COVID and stuff. I had to kind of look at it and say, you know, like, am I, am I happy where I'm at right now? Like what is my future going to look like? Like just kind of really taking a second, just kind of like stop and just like look um, kind of from the outside in. And so I saw that like my mental health, I wasn't taking, I wasn't taking care of myself properly, like mentally, mental health wise, and like just wasn't really giving, giving me like what I needed in order to truly be successful. I feel like I was spending, I didn't really even realize it, but I was spending so much time focusing on school and grades and college and all these like different things in the future that I wasn't enjoying my present time now. Um, and so I was always, I realized that I was always looking forward to the next thing or the next thing or the next event or college or you know I, I want to go to med school and like focus on that and like all these different things that are so far ahead I wasn't even enjoying my like now and being a teenager and just enjoying this present moment and so one thing with that COVID I think honestly taught me was just to be like now here in the present because sadly you know I did lose a few family members and stuff because of COVID and that took a toll on us um like on so many different aspects but I think realizing you know that like it sucks to say it but you know I was talking about this the other day that I can or any of us can pass away at any time and we are we aren't given our next breath or our, our tomorrow or any other day in the future right now all I have is my present and what I've done in the past but focusing on the now and for me I think it's important instead of to you know let these days kind of just go by and just get up and go to class and do my school work and you know, talk to my friends and go on Instagram and like, kind of just like go in the motion to truly like enjoy every single small detail, whether I'm calling up a friend or facing my friend and like, hey girl, how are you doing? Like, how has your day been? Like, just want to call and check up on you and see how are things going or going out with my, with my older brother to go grab coffee or, you know, these like, these small little things can truly mean so much and just trying my best to grasp onto these memories and truly like being present in this moment instead of focusing and, and honestly worrying um, about the future and having anxiety over that instead of focusing on the now and present. And my older brother, um, he's super smart or whatever. And he told me this quote, 
I'm probably gonna say it wrong, but I think it was like um, if you if you focus on the on the past, that causes depression. If you focus on the future, it causes anxiety. So you have to you have to focus on the now and the present. Um, I probably said that wrong, but you can look it up. <laughs> and it's really so. I mean, that's just honestly something, something that I live by is just you know focusing on like now and being here. For yeah, me, I, in the role, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sonora. I can go next. You sure? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, I was going to piggyback off of Victoria where she said um, that she had to focus on her mental health. And I think that's what a lot of teenagers, I've heard it from other students, that they really took time for themselves during the pandemic. And, were, and at least I really realized how I wanted to be treated and how I wasn't using my voice. So like I wouldn't um, so I decided that I'm going to express my support more or if I don't agree with someone, I'm going to be like, well, I'm going to tell them and um, yeah, and just definitely taking time for myself and truly knowing how or like who I am, who I am more. Def I think I definitely looked at that more. And since I am a junior looking at colleges and stuff, I think that's another thing to just look at, even though Victoria was saying like not to look too far in the future because I can you're not present and I think also I do struggle with that I think I definitely like to look more in the future and so that's um that's something that I had to take time for for myself to be with my friends my family and just truly see how I'm feeling and yeah <laughs> but um yeah that's it. and so like Sonora um I think my voice has never been as loud as it is now it's never been as strong as it is now, um, and it is due to COVID. Uh, when I took this role back in August, I don't think I understood what the impact of COVID was to people that didn't have internet connectivity. And all the kids who were not able to connect to their teachers and learn and the issues around corral and some of the students um, not being able to afford the right level of connection to do their work. And you think about the people who couldn't apply for jobs when they were losing jobs, couldn't get information, telehealth. And so digital equity is real. It, it is so important right now and COVID has just shined a bright light on it in a way that it never has. And so as an introvert um, in the past, I always liked, you know, kind of being in the back and stepping out when I felt like it. And uh, now I have no choice. I have no choice but to stand out front and talk about um, how important this is. And we're even modifying our mission and vision at MCNC because of that. We recognize the role that we play in this, particularly as it relates to education. And we will never have a better opportunity than now to help fix this problem. And so, um, yeah, I think I've found my voice in a way that. Um, I don't think I had before. And I think to piggyback on Tracy's comment, um, you asked about obstacles this year. And I think where obstacles can still turn into opportunities is in the big word of equity, right? We've been through this oh, yeah. COVID, but also racism. I, you know, it's been ongoing, it's nothing new, but I think people actually had time to pause and do something. So we're, we have not arrived. But I think the biggest obstacle for that I see a lot um, is that issue of equity. So, you know, everyone has a part to play in that. We are all connected. And so I'm hoping together we continue to work on that to overcome um, whether that's digital connectivity, digital literacy, you know, you choose it, equity shows up anywhere and everywhere. Okay, Joy, go ahead. Well, Corral certainly experienced a fair number of obstacles during the pandemic. Uh, and we have uh, found many ways to reinvent ourselves. And I'm, I'm really proud of what the team has done. But our program was contingent upon an after school program. And embedded in our mission was very much the desire to close the achievement gap. However, when school shut down, we saw you know the the equity issues that Tracy 
and Jennifer have spoken of. And we, we knew that we couldn't simply uh, allow our girls to experience this, these inequities and uh, you know, not receive an adequate education during the pandemic. So our operations changed dramatically. Uh, we went from an after school and weekend program to uh, literally creating a school at Corral. And so girls like uh, girls in the program are here uh, now 40 hours a week uh, from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. four days a week, and they're doing their schooling here. And so I have to uh, be honest that that's also changed my life dramatically. Uh, I, as an executive director, I, I had more of a, a CEO type role prior to the pandemic, and now my role is day in, day out with the girls. Uh, and, and kind of speaking to how God's prepared me for that, my master's degree in, is in school leadership. So we were able to quickly move uh, to create a school like setting for our girls from from some of the experiences that I've had. Uh, and and that has um, been an opportunity. Uh, we have seen our our girls thrive, and that's been incredibly exciting for all of us. Uh, our our girls have almost an A average. I, I think we're still waiting for final third quarter results, but we believe it's right at an A average at the end of their third quarter of, of going through virtual schooling. All of our girls have the best grades they've ever had in school. And uh, so we have turned this very difficult uh, season into an opportunity. Uh, it hasn't been without costs for everyone involved, the girls included, uh, but um, it has been exciting to see and, and we look forward to seeing how what we've learned this year about how to tactically close the achievement gap for the kids we serve will impact our program moving forward. Most notably, um, like, like in MCN, we, we did change our, our mission statement and our vision statement. And so what we've seen in, in terms of inequities in our community and, and inequities that our girls are facing uh, has impacted our organization and will forever impact the direction that we go in as an organization. Another testament to staying in the present and really facing the, the inequities that exist right here and now, despite what your tenure, you know, vision was um, and adapting for that. Thank you. Um, so we want to move into before the Q&A from all of you wonderful attendees. Um, I know some of you have prepared questions. Some of you panelists have prepared questions for each other. So I'd love to give you the opportunity to address those now, feel free to um, just jump on whenever you feel inclined. So I have one for Ms. Jennifer. Um, so my question was, being so heavily involved with social activism and fighting for those who can't always fight for themselves, um, in the beginning we kind of mentioned like our why, um, but if you wouldn't mind speaking about like a time or experience when you kind of had that like aha moment and you knew that this was what you wanted to do for the rest of your life, um, and kind of when, you, when that moment kind of like clicked and you were like, this is what like I'm going to do. I love it. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so I think there's, there's many moments in my life where that happened, but keeping with the theme of equity and education, um, I think part of it was in high school. Um, I hated, I, I hated school and I, I thought I hated learning, but I hated school because I love learning. Um, and so finding that moment where I really found um, service learning was where how I learned differently and how it became real. Like it has to make sense to my brain in order for it to really absorb it. Um, so that was a big, big part of my learning and how it affects me. And then the other part is I shared a little bit about being a first generation student. Um, but David Fleitas, who really, um, I never would have finished college without his advocacy of helping me get financial independence. Um, and so that's a huge why I do what I do because someone made it possible for me. I think everyone should be able to live up to their potential. Um, and so I wanna be able to share that opportunity with whoever I can so that the world can be a better place when everyone has their opportunities. That reminds me so much um, of this quote that one of um, actually like our interns, or not interns, I think he's like, he, um, I forget his name, but he goes, to, he went to Elon. And I remember one time we were talking about how um, somebody asked, I forget how we, I'm bad at quotes, but it was along the lines of talking about like, um, I, there's this old man, this little boy, and the old man was like planting a tree. 
And so the little boy went up to him and asked, like, why are you playing the tree? And he said, because I have, um, I picked fruit from other people's tree. So now I'm planting my own so that generations could come and pick fruit from my tree. And the whole thing of like passing up that on, like, I think that's so cool. And I think, I think you're definitely doing that um, now. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a question for you because I want to learn and hopefully other people want to learn too. Um, and we talked about this a little bit about voice and amplifying voice. So my question is, what do you think is most important for adults to learn or remember when it comes to creating like intergenerational youth and adult partnerships in, in leading for social change? Like how can we best make space or support so that all voices are equally valued? So for me, um, growing up, I think it was really hard because I initially went to like an all white private school growing up in like a little small town um, from pre-K through um, I was in fourth grade. And so for me, like I am 5'10", like I am a tall black girl. And so that was really hard for me growing up just to kind of, I, I definitely still got like a sore thumb, um, I would say. And so I kind of mentioned before, like I would I'd be really quiet. Like I love talking, but at the time I was kind of like, oh, like I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't really feel like accepted or like valued enough where I could feel like I was able to speak up and truly be like heard and listened to. Um, and so I think one thing that I really do applaud is SERP. And I, I wish I knew more about Corral, but you guys sound like amazing. <laughs> but um, one thing that I really do applaud SERP is that every time that we go and have these different meetings or we set up these different spaces and stuff, like one thing that I really, really like love and, and honestly like value so much is the fact that Jennifer, like you're always saying like, we're here, like whenever we have guest speakers, you're always saying we're here to learn from the students. So it's not just about someone, I think it's so easy for someone to come and in classes it would happen all the time where, you know, traditionally you have a teacher that comes in, you go, go to your class, she lectures about some topic, you take notes, okay, next class, that's it. And I think that's so, wow, that might've been like, effective back in the day, I think now it's so much more about like learning from each other and learning from each other's different experiences and takeaways and stuff. So I think the best way to honestly make space is probably just opening the door and, and setting these kind of ground rules of like, I'm not here to just teach you and just to kind of shove information down your throat. But like, I want to hear back from you as well. And I want to hear your thoughts and what you're feeling and your emotions and just honestly like acknowledging that this is a safe space for anyone to speak. Um, and, and that your voice will be heard and listened to and we're going to be respectful. I think that's the biggest thing is that it's one thing to kind of say this is a safe space, but to then take action and show like if something happens and kind of calling it out instantly and saying, hey, like actually that like, we value the voices of all students, like please don't try and shun another student or try and like discourage someone else's voice. I think actions can speak so much louder than words. So truly making that safe space is so monumental and truly listening um to students and stuff that's so monumental and like having them feel safe enough to actually use their voice and speak up um but yeah you guys do a great job at start with making space for students so that's why i i love going there it's it's school is one thing but SERP is definitely something else that is i actually enjoy doing so yeah <laughs> i enjoy learning with you Okay, Tracy and DJ, or and then we'll go into just snore and joy. So DJ, um, I think the question that you and I talked about actually is a little bit of a shift when you think of women in leadership, but Vic Victoria touched on it too, is self-care. You can't be good to other people unless you're good to yourself. And that may mean stepping back and having a hobby or a way to escape so that you can recharge and come back. So I was asking DJ, what does she like to do that gives her joy? Now this might be a gimme question just because she talked about it a little bit, but I would love to hear more about that. Um, well, I'm super grateful for Corral actually because I can get work and downtime here. Um, working with the horses can definitely be work sometimes, but I don't, the only other feeling, and I'm a very big book nerd, the only other like thing that gets me very like at peace 
is like in the middle of a really good book and you're like you're in your zone and like you're in this book like that's a really good feeling yeah. and being at crowd being on a horse and like being like one with your horse that might sound cheesy but i don't care that is the best feeling and yeah waking up at six o'clock to get here by seven isn't my favorite part of my day but i mean i'd say it's pretty well worth it if i get that moment in the day um and something we were talking about way earlier um the oh <laughs> Mm. oh um school and academics and how looking into the future and stuff can be kind of intimidating crowd helps because i feel like a lot of the girls are almost the exact opposite and instead of like tunneling into our future we kind of are like hey we're alive now like let's do stuff now and so a lot of the girls are like, oh, like consequences later. And I, I'm partially one of those girls. And I've had a, I've, I care about my future and I get my work done. And I do have the best grades I've ever had um, right now. Um, but being able to just like step back and, I do things like relaxing things, but with like purpose, because if I don't have a purpose behind it, I just feel anxious. I don't feel relaxed. Um, so like drawing the thing for the, um, the women's history, um, photo drawing thing. I don't know what they call it. <laughs> um, like drawing relaxes me. It's a freedom of expression to me. It's, something i can do that yeah people are going to judge me but i mean art was made to be judged i mean not in like a critical way but like i mean that's why you do it at galleries and there's like whole schools on art like it's it's free for interpretation and it's not something i take personally it's something i take as like a i didn't see it that way and that's a really cool interpretation um so doing little things like that um, and the book cover, I really enjoyed doing that because it had a purpose and, um, and it turned out pretty good, so. How, um, I don't know how long you've been on the Corral board, but I was wondering how the experience of like being on the Corral board um, was like, is different than other jobs you may have had. So first I don't see the board as a job. So that's the first order of business. And and I, I mean that jokingly and I also mean it seriously. I have been on boards of um, other nonprofits where it did kind of feel like a job. It felt like it was pretty routine. You're just kind of going through some things and then you, um, you know, everybody approved something and you went home. Um, I've never been, I've never had my heart and soul pulled so much corral. Um, it's been a blessing. It's been um, a place that I come to that I know I belong and, um, and I know I can contribute. Um, and that feels really good. And to your point, DJ, you know, you're knowing that there's something behind it. You're not just donating your time and walking away. You know, there's a chance that what you're doing by extension can really help someone, can help one of the girls that, you know, that's out here really struggling. And that's a really good feeling. I will say Joy and the rest of the board are the warmest 
um, spirits I've ever met in my life. And again, it just feels like a blessing. It feels, it feels like God led me here, which is the main reason that I stay, even though my schedule can be so crazy. It's like, ah, I got to carve this time out because that's exactly what he wants me to do. And I'm always the better for it. So I'm learning too. I'm getting something out of it too. And I really love being on this board. I'll go ahead and jump into my question for Sonora. Uh, Sonora is one of Corral's volunteers and Sonora, uh, you actually lead a team of volunteers. All of the other volunteers that you lead are older than you, in some cases much older than you. So I'm interested how you are so effective at leading a team of volunteers that is uh, so much uh, more senior than you by way of age. Um, well since it's dealing with, I'm very passionate about horses. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life, something with horses. And so when Dakota gave me this opportunity, I honestly, I was so happy and I took it immediately because I knew this was something that would better my future and it would help, it would help me get the experience that I want. And so when, so sometimes it is intimidating when I started to train the volunteers to become a volunteer corral and work with the horses it can be intimidating because they are older than me so i feel like they're going to be like why would i take older, older um orders from you like why how do you have this much experience um but honestly the people who come to volunteer corral are amazing so they don't do that but um i do it i think it takes practice i definitely like the first time i was like so unorganized in my mind and i was just i had so much planned but then it didn't work out and so for being a leader with to to being a leader and lead these other adults i kind of just um i take the experience that i have at corral and i just think of how they like i'm the one who's bringing them into corral so i think of like all that they're sorry am i frozen my thing just froze i think you're, you're good, good. Okay, sorry, my computer just like froze. Um, I'll keep talking though. Um, so yeah, it, oh. Looks like Sonora did freeze. Um, but while she is unfreezing, <laughs> if you wanna drop your question in the chat box, um, as an attendee, if you have any questions for our panelists, I know that Jennifer and DJ have an obligation at one. So we have about seven minutes and maybe one of the other panelists has to drop off too. Um, so feel free to pop any questions that you have in our chat or you can use the Q&A feature of this webinar. Um, I do have one question that came in um, that said, do you think leadership will change when we begin to serve boys, if and when so? Um, that seems like a question for Corral. So I'll let anyone, I'll let Joy. I um, was very interested in this question. Um, I am very strong opinioned about um, gender, sexuality, and race, like all of that. Like, um, I don't really have, obviously, I'm one of the girls, I have no, not no say, but. I mean, I'll graduate and I'll go to college and I'm not gonna like stay here forever. You know, hopefully I'll come back to work here. But um, I, I feel like gender, age, sexuality shouldn't really matter. I mean, we're not gonna take college students, obviously. This is a high school program and middle school. Um, but boy or girl, they are them, he, she, like, I don't think it should really matter how you lead them unless they specifically ask and they have a trigger and they tell you that the way you're leading them is hurting more than helping them. But that's on a personal specific time, like, and place, a what if. 
And if I'm being honest, everybody should be treated the same and with some um, differences. I know that teenage girls are different from teenage boys, but a matter of leading, they're both human beings. That's not, they both have emotions and feelings and both genders can choose who and what they want to be. So no, I don't think leading should change anything um, about gender, you know not one of the board members. Thank you, DJ. Um, and before anyone else answers, I want to make sure, Sonora, I think you had a question for Joy. So I want to um, acknowledge that and then we'll move on to more questions from the attendees. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so Joy, my question, since you now have such a successful co-founding of Corral, I was wondering what it was something that you stressed about when you were younger that you wish could go back and just be like, it's all right, it'll work out. Uh, let's see, I guess I really resonate with um, some of, of your stories about stressing about your future. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, planning my future and where I was gonna go to college and my career, in particular having this concept of what I want to be. And uh, that's something that I really try to unwind with my own children of this, this concept that that we're going to grow up and all of a sudden we're going to arrive at something and we're going to be something. Uh, growing up is an iteration. It's a constant iteration. We're constantly all evolving. I will be uh, until uh, until I'm, I die. And, and so when we think about our, our careers, that's an evolution as well. And God places us at a certain place in time and just gives us opportunity and builds upon that. So I certainly didn't know uh, that I was going to become a teacher. I definitely didn't know that teaching would lead me to where I am today. And I have no idea where God is going to call me to in the future. And so just being uh, willing to allow God to, to form your future and just preparing yourself uh, for that in the moment, as we've spoken about uh, earlier in this call, is, is I think something I wish I had done more when I was your age. And, and while, while I have the mic, I will pivot to the question of, of gender and leadership, uh, because I do think this is an important topic for Corral as well. Uh, we are a gender specific program, but when we're, when we're talking about leadership, I was just actually talking to my husband about this today. We have both men and women on our board of directors. And I feel strongly that that's an important part of our leadership. I feel that there's so much balance when women and men come together to make, as leadership to make, quest, uh, uh, to, to make decisions. And I feel that a, a lot in our corporate world and in our society, the, the overbalance of men in leadership really does a disservice to organizations, that women have such a powerful perspective on a different leadership style. And when that balance is achieved in leadership, really amazing things can happen. So uh, certainly our decisions about who, who we serve and, and gender will evolve as Corral grows. Uh, right now we are a gender specific program, but the idea that both men and women bring a valuable voice to leadership, I, I think is, is something that Corral will stay true to. And I, I really wanna emphasize that in, importantly because women often are the ones that don't get that voice in leadership. And that's one of the things we are trying to, to do at Corral is prepare women for that voice and leadership. Corral is so much about preparing people that don't have access, like young women, for opportunity in life and, and providing that access to underserved communities, uh, just like, like we are with, with young women right now, is so essential to who we are. Thank you for that, Joy. And, um, we do have one question, and but before people drop off, um, I'll ask that question in a follow-up email um, to you panelists, and then I'll send it out to everyone who attended. Um, but I wanted to close with an amazing opportunity to um, learn more about Corral and spread our mission. Um, so as a community, we're participating in a virtual 5K, um, a walk, run, ride. And this will happen the last week in May, May 21st to May 28th. And we will kick it off um, walking or running. Uh, well, we'll be walking the first day 
um, as a community with the girls and staff. And we're inviting our entire community to participate. Um, registrations are open and they'll be open for another two weeks. Um, so you can choose to walk, run, or ride a 5K. And it's a great way to fundraise um, to support our programming. As you know, we extended our programming to full-time um, programming. And it's a great way to spread our mission and have some fun um, getting a team together or doing it by yourself, um, whether you walk, run, or ride. And so that's, the registration is at corral5k.com. Um, so I'll send out a follow-up e follow email with that information, um, but it's a great way to move uh, for a cause. And then the girls also um, just published their second book with the NC State Literacy and Community Initiative. And it's a short story, it's a book of compilation of short stories and poetry. DJ uh, designed the, the front cover and Call Healing Starts with a Story, and there'll be a live reading on April 23rd through NC State. Um, there's a live stream link that I'll also send out in the follow-up email. So join our virtual 5K and um, tune in for that live reading. But thank you so much uh, to everyone for coming in, and um, it's really a powerful space when we all get together and get to learn and listen to each other. And if you have any questions, please respond um, to my email. I'll put in my direct contact if you have any questions about how to get further involved in Corral. And uh, thank you so much to our panelists and attendees if you want to give little snaps <laughs> for everyone. And I really appreciate uh, the space and I'll stay on here if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask questions. But I know people have to sign off. So thank you again for your time and have a wonderful weekend.